Brother Trevor, for your uh, reading this morning. And uh, yeah, a good morning to you all, dear brothers and sisters, uh, and our Lord Jesus Christ, young people uh, and friends. Um, we bring loving greetings uh, from your brothers and sisters uh, at Mount Barker. And uh, of course, Mel and I are grateful for the opportunity uh, to come and, and fellowship with you all uh, this morning. Well, what a blessing we have, uh, don't we, today to meet together in fellowship, to be reminded of the love and grace and generosity shown uh, to us by our Heavenly Father and our Lord Jesus. Uh, and if you're anything like me, uh, it's easy to come on a Sunday a little bit frazzled after wrangling kids or, or mentally exhausted uh, with the activities of the week and, and perhaps a bit burdened down with the challenges of life. Uh, and it's not always easy to be uh, in the right frame of mind as we, as we meet and, and really appreciate uh, the wonder and joy of our calling uh, in Christ. And I'm sure all of us come today with uh, varying dispositions and, and burdens and challenges. And as I look out at every one of you uh, in the audience, I, I don't know what message you need to hear today uh, or what will resonate with you, but I hope as we uh, unpack our theme uh, this morning, the image of God, uh, and converge on the remembrance of our Lord Jesus, that you'll find a message of, of comfort uh, and encouragement that you can take with you uh, into the week. So I'd like to lead off our exhortation uh, this morning with a question. Why on earth are you here? Why on earth am I here? And in case uh, you're wondering if I mean why are uh, you here at Adelaide today, uh, whilst that has some relevance, uh, it's not the main question. What I mean is for what purpose do you and I exist here on earth? For what purpose do you and I exist here on earth? You know, it's one of those uh, big questions, isn't it, that uh, is perhaps just easy to avoid and not really give much thought about. As we go about our lives, you know, we're often responding and reacting to uh, events and, and circumstances that seem to commandeer our time and, and energy, and we may or, or may not give this uh, too much thought, uh, maybe depending how philosophical a mood uh, we may be in. For what purpose do you and I exist here on earth? You know, in some ways, uh, this can be a bit of a confronting question. Um, but when the answer to this question becomes clear, it's, it's helpful for a number of reasons, and these are just a sample. It does help us get right to the heart of what is important and provides a context for our existence. It helps to draw out and define a goal or a destination and thereby uh, a direction and focus for our life. And then it uh, also helps in our decisions and choices, uh, in the way we behave, the way we use our time and energy, uh, and provides meaning uh, to what we do. Why on earth am I here? For what purpose do you and I exist here on earth? And for some uh, that exist on, on the earth, um, this question may elicit a response of, well, they're, they're here to fulfil their hopes and aspirations, uh, get as much out of this life as they can, whether that's fame, wealth, status, uh, sporting prowess, uh, experiences, or, or simply to gratify the senses uh, as much as possible. Uh, and perhaps, you know, uh, some of those people are not too concerned about what went before them or, or, or what will come after. But there are, are, of course, then many that ask uh, the deeper questions of our world and, and seek to know more about the purpose of our existence. Uh, and many turn to the Bible uh, for these answers, which, uh, you know, the Bible's a unique compilation of writings written over 15, a 1,500 year span, written over 40 generations, written by over 40 authors from every walk of life, including kings, peasants, philosophers, fishermen, poets, statesmen, scholars, shepherds, and prophets. It was written in geographically different places, written on three different continents, Africa, Asia, and Europe, written in times of war and times of peace, written during different moods, from the heights of joy to the depths of despair, and written in three languages, Hebrew, Greek, and Aramaic. And what is most unique in my view 
um, is that despite the improbable congruency of the Bible's message with such a combination of authors and time periods, is its theme and storyline is consistent and in my mind is one of the, uh, the great evidences for faith in God and the purpose that he has outlined. There's a very um, valuable verse in Deuteronomy um, that certainly I've found helpful and, and, and you may as well. In, in Deuteronomy chapter 29, verse 29, um, it's recorded there, the secret things belong unto Yahweh our God, but those things which are revealed belong unto us and to our children forever, that we may do all the words of this law. Uh, and by extension, um, you know, we can read into that that we might be in a covenant uh, relationship with God. You know, at times it can be a little uh, anxiety-inducing, uh, um, you know, contemplating the questions for which uh, we have no answers um, at times. But what I take from this verse is that Rather than being too concerned about the things that we don't know, the, the secret things, as it's uh, mentioned there, uh, we're encouraged rather to focus on the things that have been revealed that anchor us to a relationship with God and provide for us meaning, direction uh, and context for our lives uh, and leave the rest to God. The secret things belong to him. Now, what God has revealed to us uh, is the purpose for which we, humanity, uh, and as individuals are here on earth. And it's been revealed to us uh, very powerfully uh, in many ways in scripture, um, but perhaps it is most potent in this theme, the image uh, of God. So uh, let's, uh, let's start at the beginning. Uh, Genesis, uh, as many of you know, uh, means origin or beginning. And in, and in this first chapter, we have revealed for us what God wants us to know about the creation story and the purpose uh, of the creation of mankind uh, or humans. Now, it's, it's often easy for us to, uh, to read Genesis 1 and 2 uh, with a focus on uh, what was created and when, um, rather than who is the creator and why. Uh, and without uh, discounting the former, it's the who and the why uh, that we wish to focus on this morning. Now we're going to come to uh, verse 26 shortly, uh, where our theme, the image of God, uh, is taken from. Uh, but before we do, let's just start uh, set the scene uh, as we build up uh, to that verse. We won't go into extensive uh, details, but we'll draw out some of the key themes uh, that arise in this narrative. Well, uh, like all good stories, uh, they normally start with a once upon a time uh, type introduction. Uh, and Genesis is, is no different. And in verse 1 we read, In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. And, uh, you know, in our modern context, uh, we often interject at this point and start asking uh, the questions, well, well, when was this? Uh, what came before? Uh, and so on and, and so on. But the writer just wants us to know that it all begins with God. It all begins with God. And the writer goes on um, to say that in the beginning, the earth was, and the Hebrew phrase here is tohu vavohu, uh, without form and void. Um, and some translators have sort of felt that uh, a better representation of that Hebrew phrase to catch the, uh, the rhyme is, is wild and waste. The earth was uh, wild and waste, and darkness was over the face of the deep. Uh, and, and that uh, Hebrew word is, is to home, uh, often used to describe these chaotic waters uh, or this, uh, this abyss. And it's into this chaotic uh, nothingness state that the spirit of God, uh, the ruach of God, wind, breath, invis invisible presence, uh, was hovering over the face of these waters. Uh, and what follows in the narrative are, are these six days uh, of creation. Now, that you'll, you'll note that every day begins with God said. Uh, his ruach, the mind and purpose of God, uh, being brought to bear on this wild and waste place. And uh, each day then ends uh, with, and there was evening uh, and there was morning. 
Now, what we notice is that uh, on days one to three, God is creating these uh, environments. So day one, we've got light introducing day and night, uh, so time. Um, day two, we've got uh, the sky and the seas. Uh, day three, the dry land uh, and vegetation. And now on days four and six, we have God comes back to populate these environments. So day four has the sun, moon and stars to rule the day uh, and the night. Uh, day five, the birds in the sky uh, and the fish in the sea. And day six, the land animals uh, in humans. So in terms of the themes in the, in the creation account uh, and what this reveals about the creator, uh, a key one is that God brings his spirit, his will, his life-giving presence to something that is chaotic, wild and waste, and he provides structure and order and turns it into something beautiful, um, as is the meaning when God summarises his work as good, or the Hebrew word tov uh, mean, means beautiful. And what we also notice is that uh, God's creation brings benefit. So time, day and night, um, you know, the heavenly lights provide navigation. Uh, they also help to mark events and seasons. Well, who's that meaningful to? To all creatures, but particularly to humans. Then we have uh, the fruit from the trees with the seed for, for perpetuating um, its kind. You know, that uh, is beneficial to humans uh, for food. You know, these are just some very quick examples which begin to reveal who this creator is and why he is doing, uh, doing this. And it leads us uh, into verse uh, 26 to talk about uh, the image of God. So let's, uh, let's read uh, together from verse uh, 26 uh, to 31. So we read, then God said, uh, let us. And uh, an interesting cross-reference uh, on that verse is uh, 1 of Kings uh, 22, uh, verse 19 to 23, where there's this picture of a, a divine council. Um, that's, that's an interesting cross-reference uh, when thinking about this verse. So God said, let us uh, make man, or Adam, human, uh, in our image, after our likeness. And let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over the livestock and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. And God blessed them and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the heavens, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. And God said, Behold, I've given you every plant yielding seed that is on the face of all the earth, and every tree with seed uh, in its fruit. You shall have them for food, and to every beast of the earth, and to every bird of the heavens, and to everything that creeps on the earth, Everything that has the breath of life, I have given every green plant for food, and it was so. And God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. And it's interesting to note that uh, the sixth day is the, is the time where uh, all the other days it says, and God saw that it was good, and we come to day six, and it was very good. And perhaps uh, what's uh, being presented to us is that humans uh, were the crowning pinnacle of the creation um, on the sixth day. Uh, and then it says, and there was evening and there was morning the sixth day. Now, the, uh, the idea of an image uh, is often used in the Bible uh, in the context of idols, uh, whose purpose was to represent a deity, um, to witness to the deity's uh, presence and power in that place, uh, and it's interesting to note that in many uh, ancient cultures, uh, it would be the king who would say, I am God's representative uh, on earth, therefore do what I say. And, and uh, you know, there would often be uh, images of these kings depicted as, as godlike figures. But in the creation story, 
all humans are made in the image of God and, and one reason why um, you know, the Israelites were told uh, not to have any graven images uh, is because God had already made an image to represent him, humans. Humans are to represent God, to be uh, an expression of him uh, within creation, uh, just as God brought about order, beauty uh, and benefit, um, so humans are to do the same. Uh, and so the work uh, given to them was to have dominion, to rule uh, and have stewardship over creation. Um, and further to this, uh, they were told to be fruitful, to bring benefit, uh, to multiply, have a community uh, and expand the image of God uh, throughout the earth. Now, this is where, uh, looking through the lens of uh, why on earth am I, I here, um, you know, I, I try to ask myself each day, and it's generally not before my, my first coffee, <laughs> but uh, is my mindset toward my family, uh, my ecclesia, my work, uh, the community in general, uh, about bringing order from chaos and beauty from what is wild and waste, is my mindset aimed at bringing benefit toward others uh, and an environment for, for growth and uh, for others to thrive? You know, it, it would appear from Genesis uh, that this is a key aspect of what it is uh, to image God. You know, when I've often uh, reflected on what God's purpose is, you know, the line that, uh, you know, often comes to me is, well, to fill the earth with his glory. And from there, it sort of usually flows to uh, explain God's glory as his character. Um, we then have a succinct sort of picture that, you know, God is going to fill the earth with people that show his character, uh, which is all true. Um, and however, there is this other sort of dimension to this, uh, that that is that God is looking for a relationship. He wants us to be connected with him. So imaging God is not just having, you know, similar values or, or character traits, um, but then sort of being in our own corner and God being, um, you know, more like an acquaintance, perhaps like, you know, maybe uh, some philanthropists might sort of operate. But imaging God is connected to a personal relationship uh, where we are co-working with God um, as his images. Uh, you know, and a few interesting verses sort of around that that sort of reinforce that idea. You know, Micah chapter 6, verse 8, talks about, He has told you, O man, what is good, and what does Yahweh require of you but to do justice, to love kindness, and to walk humbly with your God. It's, it's a relationship, a connected relationship. Um, 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 9, where... Uh, encouraged by Paul, where he says, for we are God's fellow workers. Uh, you are God's field, uh, God's building. And, and that idea of being connected as a fellow worker in a relationship with God. So this, um, this idea of imaging God as, as fellow workers continues uh, into chapter 2 uh, in Genesis. Um, we note that um, work is something that is in place uh, before the fall. Work was in place uh, before, before the fall. So work is not as a result of the curse. Work's, work is a good thing. Uh, and God also works. And we see uh, there in uh, verse 1 to 3, um, chapter 2, uh, that three times it mentions the work that God had done. Uh, and then note in verse uh, 5 and verse 15 uh, these key phrases. Verse 5, there was no man to work the ground. Uh, and verse 15, uh, the Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and keep it. So humans are to image God as, as fellow workers uh, in a relationship with him uh, to bring order and beauty uh, out of chaos uh, for the benefit of others. Um, you know, we often explain this in terms of uh, God manifestation, don't we? It's, it's the same uh, concept. Um, and there's some great examples of, of this uh, through scripture. Uh, one that I really love and I think just sort of 
brings this home is uh, the episode of, of Moses at the burning bush in, in Exodus uh, chapter 3. Um, and from verse uh, 7 to 12, we, we have uh, there recorded for us that uh, then Yahweh said, I've surely seen the affliction of my people who are in Egypt and have heard their cry because of their taskmasters. I know their sufferings and I have come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of that land to a good and broad land. And a few verses down, um, God then says to Moses, come, I will send you to Pharaoh that you may bring my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. Um, and uh, it's very interesting so that this, you know, God's telling Moses that on one hand, he's going to deliver uh, Israel, and then on the other hand says, I'm going to send you Moses. And it's kind of like, well, um, what? I'll do it, but I'm sending you. Like, who, who's actually doing this, me or you? Is it God or is it Moses? But what God was doing was inviting Moses in to participate to image or manifest him in this task as a fellow worker um, with the promise uh, that I will be with you. Uh, and that's a bit of a theme we'll, we'll come back to uh, a bit later. You know, people often say, don't they, uh, I don't believe in a God because of all the injustices in the world. How can there be a God? Yet when we look through scripture at how many times God directly intervenes versus how many times he works through the agency of willing humans, we find the latter uh, is often the way that God works. You know, so sometimes if, if we're concerned with the, with the injustice in the world as individuals and, and as a race, we have to ask, well, what are we and, and what am I uh, doing? Am I being just uh, in my dealings, um, certainly at a, a micro level? Uh, but on the whole, for humanity, that's a question uh, to ask. So back to Genesis, humans um, are made to image God uh, as fellow workers in a relationship with him, to bring order and beauty out of chaos for the benefit of others. Now notice that day seven does not end with, and there was evening and there was morning the seventh day. It doesn't end with that phrase like the other days. And uh, I suggest what is being communicated uh, is that in God's purpose, day seven has no end. That is God's vision uh, and the goal or purpose of creation for God to share creation with his images so they can rest and rule it with him forever. Now, certainly what I've come to appreciate from this is the, uh, you know, the overflowing uh, abundant generosity and, and goodness of our creator. And we sort of sung some of those themes in uh, the opening hymn. Um, and what a special thing that, you know, our creator wants us to dwell um, with him and him with us. Um, it's it's uh, an amazing thing to think about. Well, um, you know, as we know, the story in Genesis 2 uh, continues and, and we're told in uh, verse 8, uh, to nine, that God placed Adam in the garden uh, within Eden. And the tree of life was in the midst of the garden and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Uh, and in verse 16 to 17, we read, uh, and Yahweh uh, Elohim commanded the man, saying, you may surely eat of every tree of the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die." Now, there's definitely uh, lots of points that could be made here, but a, a couple of just summary points uh, from this section, uh, just to keep uh, on track of uh, time, um, is that the tree of life was in many ways uh, a symbol of being connected with the author of life, Yahweh Elohim, a reminder that life and everything good um, uh, has been given by him. And then we have uh, the tree of the knowledge of, of good and evil, which you know, represented uh, a test of faith uh, and a choice for Adam and Eve, the task to you know, image God, 
uh, was, was going to require wisdom and discernment to rule the creation. Um, but the question is, is would they trust God to be taught by him and remain in an intimate relationship? Or would they choose autonomy from God to define good and evil uh, for themselves by their, their own knowledge and to take for themselves rather than to receive? Uh, you know, and as the story unfolds in, in Genesis 3, we, we see the choice uh, that they made um, after the encounter with the serpent, and that choice was to take uh, the fruit. Uh, and, and Eve gave it to Adam, who was with her, and, and he ate uh, as well. Now, that choice in the end was to define good and evil for themselves, to do what was right in their, in their own eyes. Uh, and as a result, their, their eyes were opened, and things changed. They knew they were naked. Now, was that good or bad? Well, there was uh, clearly a feeling of a need to, to cover up uh, for one reason or another. Um, did they now distrust each other? Um, there was now a hesitancy about their relationship uh, with God, such that they, they hid themselves and they were afraid. Uh, it's the first time that fear uh, is mentioned um, in, in the scriptures. Now, Adam and Eve are uh, exiled from the garden. They're, they're removed from access to the tree of life uh, and what it symbolised. And the way back to the tree of life was now guarded by a flaming sword. And the word guarded is the same Hebrew word uh, shema for what Adam was tasked with to keep uh, or shema the garden. Uh, and in the end, it was a failure to image God uh, and treasure an intimate relationship with the creator above being one's own authority of what is good and evil, uh, doing what was right in their own eyes. You know, and down through history, we see the same pattern, don't we, of, of humans defining uh, good and evil for themselves. And we see the effects of taking what is good in our eyes, what is best for me and for my people, and the consequence of, of sin is, is evident in our, our broken world. And when we reject uh, God's wisdom and, and define good and evil uh, for ourselves, we we regress back to that tohu vavohu, the, the wild and waste. It's like a, a decreation of the order and the beauty that, that God had brought out of that. You know, and we see this on a, a macro scale, um, you know, and, and even at a micro level uh, every day. But Adam and Eve are not left without hope, uh, as we and, and all humanity are not left without hope. And as the serpent is cursed for, for his part, uh, God declares that one of the seed, that one uh, of the seed of the woman, would defeat the serpent thinking and, and would defeat sin. Uh, and the Bible story continues uh, to unfold. Uh, and this promised seed is revealed as the way back to the tree of life, a way back to a connection uh, with the Creator to truly be the image uh, of God. Um, sometimes we take the kids out to uh, Mount Crawford Forest. Uh, many of you might have uh, been out there. It's been a bit cold lately, but, uh, yeah, we, we often go out there and do some orienteering uh, with the kids, and the kids love it. It's a bit of a, an adventure and, and some fun using a map and, uh, and a compass. Um, however, without those things, it's, it's really hard to sort of know where you're going and uh, what you're aiming for, what's the destination, um, and, and what is the way. And I find that a really helpful metaphor um, for the plight of humanity, that uh, defining good and evil for ourselves is, is like really having no map and no compass. We're just wandering around, hopelessly lost. But God has given us a map and a compass in his son, the Lord Jesus, to travel back to the tree of life uh, and to an intimate relationship uh, with him. And the words of Jesus uh, in John 14, verse 6, are quite familiar to us, aren't they? Jesus said, um, it was to one of his disciples, Thomas, um, I am the way uh, and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Now, Jesus used uh, a number of titles to refer to himself um, through his ministry uh, in the Gospels, but perhaps none more than the title 
son of man, which I believe um, is used something like 81 times uh, in the Gospels. Now, it sort of begs the question, why this title? Um, And particularly at the time, as uh, many would have been expecting Jesus to uh, use the title and and talk of himself in terms of being the Messiah, uh, the Anointed One. And a suggestion is is that the the term Messiah was a highly political uh, and military charged title. It was the the figure that Israel uh, was looking for uh, to deliver them from the Romans. The title Son of Man, however, um, had a much greater message of deliverance uh, attached to it. And uh, the Son of Man title essentially means the human Man, as we know, is, is the Hebrew Adam, um, or human, and, and hopefully we can start to see this theme connection, that Jesus is, is presenting himself as the true human, the second Adam, the image of God, um, the ideal of what was meant uh, in the beginning. And uh, this idea is uh, picked up by many of the writers in the New Testament Um, The writer to the Hebrews, uh, in establishing the credentials of the Lord Jesus, says in Hebrews chapter 1, verse 3, who being in the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. And uh, we're sort of presented there with, with Jesus as the image, this, this image of God. Uh, and also in that passage, there's some amazing echoes back uh, to Daniel chapter 7. Now, what's quite uh, interesting is that when Jesus was on trial uh, before the high priest, um, he was asked if he was the Christ, the Son of God. And he says, his response is, I am, and then quotes Daniel chapter 7, verse 13. I am. You will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of power and coming with the clouds of heaven. And when you go back and read uh, Daniel chapter 7 with the the image of God uh, in mind, the echoes to Genesis 1 and 2 uh, are quite apparent. You have the the human, the image of God, uh, connected with the Ancient of Days, given dominion uh, that lasts forever. So there's our day seven. Uh, And and this is what Jesus achieved uh, for all of us who believe uh, in him. He's the image of God that we can't be in our own strength. He's the one who chose the intimate relationship with the Father Uh, and the wisdom of God above defining good and evil for himself. He defeated sin, and he's opened the way back to a relationship with God and access uh, to the tree of life, and uh, he has benefited all of creation. Colossians 1, uh, verse 15, talks of, of Jesus in this way. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. Uh, And now we're starting to talk about the new creation uh, that is in Christ Jesus. And so we begin to uh, converge our thoughts uh, on the image of God with with the remembrance of our Lord Jesus uh, in the emblems uh, before us this morning. And our Lord Jesus uh, invites uh, us to share in his life as the image of God to become a new creation. Uh, where he will work in us uh, and through us, uh, and the words of John 17, verse verse 21, uh, that they may all be one, just as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be in us. You know, it's the vision of the seventh day, isn't it, back in Genesis, that, that unified relationship of God and man. Now, we don't have time to cover this, but... Uh, At the other end of the Bible, as as the other bookend to Genesis, we have the vision realised in Revelation uh, chapters 21 and 22 with the new Jerusalem, the followers of Jesus, coming down out of heaven uh, from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. 
Uh, and what was lost in Genesis uh, is restored uh, in Revelation. Uh, and just some words from uh, chapter 21, verse 3 and 4. I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them and they will be his people and God himself will be with them as their God. And he will wipe away every tear from their eyes and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning nor crying nor pain anymore for the former things have passed away. And so as we uh, mentioned in our introduction, there is so much to be grateful for, for all the abundant goodness and generosity and grace we have received from God, who in the words of Colossians has transferred us into the kingdom of his beloved son, who is working in us to change us uh, into the image of God. And we began in our uh, exhort uh, um, this morning with, with a question, why on earth are you here and, and why on earth am I here? Well, it's to image God and enjoy fellowship with him and Jesus, his son, along with all the new creation. And hopefully, as we've briefly explored uh, this morning, like uh, this theme uh, and getting to uh, sort of open up this, this question, it helps us to get right to the heart of, of what's important and provide a context for our existence, especially to know and appreciate uh, the love of God toward us. It helps to define the goal, the, the destination and direction of our life. So fellowship with God and his son and all the family in heaven uh, and on earth. Uh, and in terms of helping us with our, our decisions and, and everyday choices to be images of God by faith uh, in Jesus, to see how we can bring benefit to others uh, in our families, in the ecclesia and in the broader community, and to know that it is God and our Lord Jesus who are working in us uh, to bring about this change. Soon we're, uh, we're going to partake of the uh, emblems uh, this morning and, and reflect uh, on the new covenant. And uh, we sort of have that expressed to us in uh, the words of Corinthians 11, uh, verse 25, um, where Paul talks about that uh, supper and says, in the same way, uh, Jesus took the cup after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, uh, do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so we're being asked to participate in the new covenant. Uh, what are we being asked to participate uh, in? Well, we're taken back to the words of Jeremiah, where the new covenant, this is in Jeremiah 31, is about a changed humanity, a new creation, the image of God, uh, where there is an emphasis on what God will do. Um, just as he said to Moses, I'll, I'll be with you. The words of Jeremiah 31 are, for this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares Yahweh. I will put my law within them and I will write it on their hearts and I will be their God and they shall be my people. And no longer shall each one teach his neighbour and each his brother saying, No, Yahweh, for they shall all know me, from the least of them to the greatest, declares Yahweh, for I will forgive their iniquity and I will remember their sin no more. And so as we participate now together in the, in the taking of these emblems, uh, celebrating and remembering the, the new creation uh, that has been brought about in Jesus Christ, um, I'll leave you with the words of, of Hebrews chapter 10, uh, verse 19 to 24. Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain that is through his flesh, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water, let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. 
and let us consider how to stir up one, one another to love uh, and good works. Thank you.